everybody. I'm Joe Jackson. Welcome to the Military Aircraft Video Report. Well, we have another excellent show for you. In this edition, we're going to look into the world of Canadian air defense. Then, from the cold of the frozen tundra, it's off to the desert of Arizona for A-10s in action. All that and more is coming up. Here's a preview. We're also going to step into the world of the fabulous Harrier. Get set to join the Marines at the forward edge of the battle as they take the now famous jump jet into action. We'll also see how the British are setting new standards with the Sea Harrier. Also, climb aboard for military aircraft Canadian style as we visit CFB Comox in British Columbia. You'll see CF-18s flying high over the frozen tundra and hear what the pilots have to say about the essence of today's air combat. Well, hot dogfight, as they say, you know, the, again, with the new aircraft, the F-15, uh, the F-16, the F-18, the turn capabilities are so incredible, and the fight is so close, that's where they've turned this uh, uh, comment, you know, it's like a knife fight in a telephone booth, so it's, uh, it's close, and it's dynamic. What's it like to fly for the Marine Corps? Find out with some of the most gut-wrenching maneuvers ever put on film. And finally, join us for a trip to the Arizona desert for A-10s in action. This airplane has no match in the world of close air support, and you'll be there close enough to see its incredible Avenger cannon cutting loose. Before we get to those feature stories, let's take a look at some of the latest developments in the world of military aviation. There are some new airplanes coming out and some older planes being upgraded with new missions to perform. Let's take a look at the highlights. Meet the newest version of the A-6 Intruder, the A-6F. The latest addition of this venerable attack plane will keep this aircraft at the forefront of the Navy all-weather attack community. But even though it may look similar to earlier models, Grumman has built in some important changes in performance and payload. The most dramatic difference is the use of the F-404 GE-404 engines, providing a 15% increase in thrust. Other changes are explained here by Dan Collins, the A-6 program vice president. The weapon load on the aircraft consists of two sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles mounted on the outboard wing stations, two high-speed harm anti-radiation missiles mounted on the wing inboard stations, and 18 Mark 82 500-pound bombs. New avionics will give the A-6F systems much in common with the F-14D and the F-A-18. This will allow the Navy to purchase larger amounts of one-item replacement parts, resulting in cost savings and ease of maintenance. It won't be long before the new A6F gets a low-visibility paint job and joins active-duty squadrons. Meantime, the older A6s will be getting new wings and other upgrades. There's no doubt this familiar shape will be around at least until the start of the next century. Not bad for an airplane that first flew in 1959. Here's another proven airframe that's getting a new role to perform. This is the Navy's new E-6A. Based on the AWACS airframe, this plane will carry out the Navy's mission of airborne communications with the nation's ballistic missile submarine fleet, a job that is currently being handled by specially equipped Lockheed C-130s. Boeing's E-6 has been specially hardened against the effects of electromagnetic, thermal, and blast effects. It makes use of the new CFM-56 engine, which is also being used to re-engine KC-135s. Here's Boeing's chief executive officer, Frank Schrantz. We're going to do the best that we can to make sure that the Navy flies Boeing well into the future. In order to communicate with ballistic missile submarines, the Navy uses a very low-frequency communication system in the airplanes. There is a land-based system to communicate with subs, but it is vulnerable to attack. With these new airplanes, the Navy will have more flexibility and more capabilities than it ever had before. In all, 15 aircraft are needed. Total cost, $1.5 billion. A 
lot of money, yes, but most of the cost is in the avionics, not the airframe. Although this may look pretty unobtrusive, the E-6 is one of the most mission-capable aircraft in the air today. Elsewhere, here is an interesting sight being seen by folks at air shows these days. No, your eyes are not deceiving you. That is a MiG-15. It's all being made possible by Unlimited Aircraft of Chino, California. The firm is importing the MiG-15s from the People's Republic of China, restoring them and offering the planes for sale to civilian owners. Unlimited is said to be negotiating for MiG-17s and 19s as well. No doubt, the still flyable F-86 Sabres will be feeling a bit of deja vu when this old foe starts to show up in increasing numbers. And while on the subject of vintage airplanes, it was 35 years ago that go-ahead was given to build the B-58 Hustler. From the start, it was apparent this airplane would be a record setter. Technology instantly took several giant strides. The Hustler has mid-mounted delta wings, which was quite an innovation at the time. Because of the high temperatures associated with Mach 2 flight, skin panels were made of aluminum glass fiber honeycomb between layers of metal. The bomber also made the first use of the escape capsule concept. The crew sat in individual capsules that could be ejected in an emergency. That allowed for ejection at supersonic speed. The Hustler was armed with a 20 millimeter Vulcan cannon in the tail and a special pod under the airplane which was used to carry nuclear or conventional bombs. The pod also carried fuel and could be jettisoned once it was empty. But the main feature of the B-58 was speed. Powered by four J-79 GE-1 engines, it could cruise at nearly 1,500 miles per hour for nearly 3,000 miles. The Hustler started right out breaking records. During the course of its career, the B-58 won the Thompson, Blériot, Bendix, McKay, and Harmon trophies for outstanding flight performance. It set 14 world records in international competition. For example, this flight from Texas to California at nearly the speed of sound with the plane never more than 500 feet above the ground. Low-level penetration at high speed is accepted practice today. At this time, however, this was really something. In SAC combat competition, a crew from Carswell Air Force Base scrambled, started engines, and got wheels rolling in two minutes and ten seconds, half the time required for other bombers of the time. Later, special courses were set up, and the B-58 broke record after record for speed. The next step was to go for altitude records, and those two fell to the Hustler. In this case, 16 and a half miles high, beating marks set by the Soviets. The next world records fell as the B-58 dashed from Los Angeles to New York and back to Los Angeles in four hours and 41 minutes. Then it was a non-stop flight from Carswell Air Force Base to Paris. They call this one the Lindy Hop, with the Hustler stopping on the exact spot where the spirit of St. Louis came to rest. The need for a high-speed weapons delivery system is being met today with the B-1B. But the place in history held by the B-58 Hustler is secure. It was the first of its kind, and some would argue, still one of the best. Now, let's get to our first feature story. Canada's Air Defense Forces are responsible for patrolling and defending one of the largest territories in the world. As we found out during our visit to Comox, British Columbia, there are some special people and some special airplanes doing an excellent job of covering that territory. the focal point for Canadian Air Forces on the west coast of North America. 
and it houses one of the most remarkable and diverse collections of military aircraft in the world. This is CFB Comox, and what follows is the story of the people and machines that make this place unique. Comox is located on Vancouver Island. It sits in a perfect location to cover the vast waters of the Gulf of Alaska and the equally huge expanse of the Canadian Yukon. It's a big job. But cutting it down to size is routine for the personnel here. The base commander is Colonel Ted Given. Well, it's a maritime air group base, which uh, is uh, the headquarters are in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And we have uh, in the Maritime Air Group the 407 Squadron with Aurora's and the uh, 33 Squadron with T-33s and uh, tracker airplanes. We have uh, 442 uh, Transport Squadron, which is a search and rescue squadron out here. And now with 441, we have uh, the Fighter Squadron, which really completes the, the whole picture for us. The newest airplanes to call this base home are the McDonnell Douglas CF-18s of 441 Squadron, the Silver Foxes. The plane is virtually identical to that flown by the Marine Corps and U.S. Navy, except the carrier landing system has been removed. And it appears the Canadian pilots are as happy with the CF-18 as their American counterparts have been. In our business, if we were to offer any, any fighter in the world, uh, which one we would pick right now, there's not a Canadian pilot that I know of. Uh, there may be a couple, but uh, certainly 99% of them, I would say, would, uh, would choose the F-18. And That's Lieutenant Colonel Ian Struthers, commander of the 441 Squadron. And as you can see, a big fan of his new airplanes. At Comox, the CF-18s are replacing the CF-101s, several of which still haunt the tarmac. At this point, only part of the squadron is based here. The rest of the unit is located at Cold Lake, Alberta, which is also the central training base for the CF-18 pilots. Along with the pilots, the ground crew is learning how to get the most out of Canada's newest fighter, one of only two new military aircraft types purchased by the country since 1971. On all counts, the support staff is, like Corporal McMullen here, pretty impressed. Uh, we're pretty confident in our job and uh, the people that work, all the support people. We're support trade. We support the aircraft, uh, basically. That's, so we're not, pretty, we're not too worried. We know we're trying to do the best we can and we know it's safe for him. The CF-18 represents a quantum leap in technology and nothing makes it more apparent than a look around the cockpit. Lieutenant Serge Bordeaux explains. In this airplane, if uh, you have a problem, there's a possibility, let's say, on this uh, DDI to bring up a uh, checklist, uh, approach plates uh, and the likes, and this enables you to be a lot quicker in your response uh, if you have uh, any kind of problem. All this digital technology has a purpose, and at Comox, the mission is air defense. The CF-18 stand alert in shelters, ready to intercept, identify, and if necessary, destroy intruders. It's all part of the Canadian commitment to the North American Aerospace Defense Command. Uh, we have two aircraft that are on alert all the time to respond to NORAD and Cheyenne Mountain, or Canada West Sector, which also feeds through uh, North Bay in uh, Ontario. Uh, those aircraft are to respond to uh, airliners that are off course, uh, unknown targets, people that haven't flight planned. As they enter uh, your airspace or ours and uh, they shouldn't be there or they have not announced their intended arrival, then NORAD with an unknown track will launch these aircraft to go up and uh, identify the airplane and see what type it is. And when the CF-18s come out to take care of business, it's quite a sight.
the clouds, the aircraft settles in for the mission. Up here, one comes to grips with just how big Canada is. The vast territory poses a formidable challenge for the CF-18. And since this patrol promises to be a long one, refueling will be necessary. We'll get back to our CF-18s in a moment. Meanwhile, other things are happening back at the base. Another important mission here is search and rescue. That's where the CC-115 Buffaloes of 442 Squadron come in. The Buffalo is manufactured right here in Canada by de Havilland Aircraft. It is capable of operating from short and semi-prepared airstrips, and its flight characteristics make it perfect for searching in mountainous terrain. The unit commanding officer is Lieutenant Colonel Ed J. The Buffalo is an ideal aircraft for operating in this region. Uh, it has the uh, sufficient speed and, uh, and power to operate in the mountainous regions. As you know, uh, it gets a little tricky trying to, uh, to conduct uh, any kind of flying in some of the mountain valleys. And the Buffalo has the ability to turn uh, in a fairly uh, enclosed area and also the power to climb out of uh, enclosed uh, valleys. 442 Squadron also operates the CH-113 Labrador. Manufactured by Boeing Vertol, it is fully amphibious has a cruising speed of 170 miles per hour and a range of over 600 miles. Like the Buffalo, it is constantly being put to the test. Well, there's something in the order of uh, 4,000 incidents a year in the, uh, the BC region. Uh, not all of those are real incidents, a lot of them are false alarms, but we have to respond to, uh, to every incident as if it is a real uh, occurrence. Of course, it is the people who man the aircraft that really make the rescue mission a success. When someone is in distress, it takes men like Sergeant John Carrier to go in and save lives. Uh, you uh, jump out of helicopters, you do diving, uh, the helicopter work, uh, and just being in the rescue, uh, rescue uh, doing rescue techniques is, uh, and taking that, that bit of a chance is, uh, makes it quite challenging. 442 Squadron has a long history of saving people. From mountaintops to stormy seas, there seems to be little they won't do to save a life. But at least for Sergeant Carrier, there is one thing that will cause him to think twice. Believe it or not, grizzly bears are number one on the list of dangerous problems. Uh, getting to a crash site is uh, we're well trained and uh, we know what we're doing. The thing is, is, once we get to a crash site, we don't know what's there. And uh, depending, uh, it could be grizzlies over there, it could be all sorts of things. Uh, so that's my biggest worry is grizzly bears. This is the CP-140 long-range anti-submarine and maritime patrol aircraft. Right now, the Canadian Armed Forces have 18 Auroras, as they are known. Future plans call for acquiring six more of this Canadian version of the U.S. Navy Orion. Considering the amount of area these aircraft patrol, even twice that number of new airplanes would be welcome. It's not unusual to find Soviet ships and airplanes out there. Captain Kevin Parker. You could go a streak where you have them a whole bunch of times and at other times you don't see them for the longest of times. You know, but you constantly see commercial ships and lots of Russian fishing boats and uh, Russian liners, you know, grain coming from Vancouver or something going uh, to Russia. You know, they're all out there. The average mission in an Aurora can last for 12 hours or more. Fatigue is a factor. But if something happens, this four-engine bomber can turn from a docile flying platform to one that turns with the best of them. It's a large aircraft, so some people may think that, well, it's a big airplane, you don't get to yank and bank and have a good time with it. But it is a large aircraft, but it's very maneuverable for its size. And in that aspect, uh, you know, we do a lot of low-level flying, uh, down 100 feet, 200 feet, uh, yanking and banking the thing around. And it's got so much power on tap instantaneously with the turboprops that uh, it's, it's a nice machine to, to cruise around in. However, most of the time is spent watching the landscape and scanning the glowing consoles. Some days we have to go right down to, you know, 100 feet above the water at times, and other days we can stay up higher uh, in the teens or even in the 20s of, you know, 20,000 feet or whatever. It all depends on what our mission is. We try to stay as high as we can, as long as we can, to save the gas. Speaking of gas, let's get back to our CF-18s. It is now time to hook up to the tanker and refuel. 
This is routine for the pilots. But the scene of this delicate, graceful process taking place high above the frozen north is not soon forgotten by the first-time spectator. The Canadians have a unique paint scheme on the CF-18s. On the bottom of the aircraft, they have painted a false canopy, the purpose of which is explained by Lieutenant Colonel Struthers. In this instance, it's put on the false canopy is put on the on the bottom to give the other fighter um, a slight decision-making process. Is that aircraft coming towards me? Is that like that canopy? It looks like it's coming towards me, or is it going away? That indecision will allow you to get a few more angles in your fight. Okay, the more angles you can get on the other fighter, the better the opportunity of uh, prosecuting the, the target. The refueling completed, the CF-18s are ready to continue the mission. A job that is being accomplished like never before, now that the CF-18 is online. For instance, the human engineering in the cockpit for a pilot is absolutely superb. You don't have to look inside, you can change all your displays, anything else, without taking your hands off the throttles or the stick. Back at Comox, a truly vintage airplane is being readied for flight. Known here as the CT-133, American pilots know it as the venerable T-33. These airplanes have the Rolls-Royce engine with slightly more thrust than the U.S. counterpart. Despite its age, most were built in the early 50s, pilots like Captain Martin Bagley are happy to take the controls. Well, I'd certainly like to fly an F-18 someday. I have a lot of affection for this and, and for the tracker that I also fly. It's, uh, it's a very nice airplane. When, when you go to air shows, it attracts uh, a lot of attention from people that used to fly it and uh, perhaps worked on it and in some respects it's uh, has a far more unique character than uh, F-14s, 15s, 16s and things like that. The CT-133s perform a variety of tasks at Comox. They act as a target during radar tracking exercises, simulate missile profiles for ships air defense and tow targets during live gunnery exercises. The airplane is very useful for the job that uh, that it does with us, it, it's hard to think of something that would, uh, that would be better. The aircraft has, uh, has great range, it's very economical to, to operate, and, uh, and very reliable by and large. The engine has certainly proved that. It's been in, in service for a long time. And, uh, and they're all paid for. Any, any uh, replacement aircraft would, would cost a lot of money. The Canadian Armed Forces is getting its money's worth out of another venerable airplane as well. This is the CP-121 Tracker. Another veteran of service with the U.S. Navy, the Tracker's patrols are flown in support of the Department of Fisheries. Ranging as far as 200 miles out to sea, there is a surprising amount of activity to keep an eye on. Technically, we're responsible for an area that's uh, 200 miles out to sea, that Canada's economic zone, and from the U.S.-Canadian border down here up to uh, the U.S.-Canadian border in Alaska. And, uh, number four, do you want to check them out? That's turn two hours. Yeah. As soon as we're done here, boy, we'll climb up and get some more radar fixes on them. The tracker is going to be around for a while. A program is underway which will see them re-engined with turboprops. The entire inventory of 18 trackers will be upgraded for about $100 million. A bargain considering what the Canadians will get in the way of increased capabilities. Well. The flying day is nearly drawing to a close at CFB Comox. The Buffalo is back. It too has had a long day. Well, the longest period that uh, we can spend in the aircraft is up to 18 hours. Our maximum crew day is 18 hours long. Uh, we would search normally as long as daylight permits, or in the case of an electronic search, uh, we could be carrying it out at night too. But uh, 18 hours is the maximum crew day we can fly to.
And it's time for the final approach of the CF-18s. It is apparent that this airplane, too, is up to the job. But perhaps even more important, the confidence of the air crews is at an all-time high. It means that if I'm going up against any other aircraft in the world, uh, fighter-wise, I walk up with a great deal of confidence into that fight. It doesn't mean I can't be beat, but it means that uh, I have everything at my disposal to uh, enter the fight and win. Not every aircraft in the Canadian Armed Forces is here at Comox, but most types are represented. Throughout the history of the base, legends like the Lancaster, the Argus, and the Neptune have held sway. And the professionalism of the personnel here has always shown through. Perhaps the squadron motto of VU-33 says it best, the end crowns the deed. And here at Comox, the deed is being accomplished like nowhere else in the world. While we were at Comox, other airplanes that stopped by included a P-3 from New Zealand and U.S. Navy A-6s from Whidbey Island Naval Air Station. Comox is truly aviation central, not only for Western Canada, but for the entire Pacific Rim as well. There's no mistake in the sight and the sound of the Harrier taking off. In our next story, let's take a look at this remarkable airplane, starting with the latest edition of this proven performer. Say hello to the newest version of the Harrier family, the two-seat TAV-8B Harrier, soon to be delivered to the Marines at Cherry Point. Of all the airplanes in the inventory of the free world, the Harrier stands alone, literally. It is unique in looks, performance, and mission capability. The design first flew back in 1960 as a prototype built by the British firm Hawker Siddeley. Partially from lessons learned in the Vietnam War, the Marine Corps got interested and acquired some of the early model Harriers. Pilots like Captain Rob Ng had to learn to fly a whole new class of fighter plane. Learning the difference between uh, conventional flight and the transition phase into V-stall, or vertical and short takeoff and landing, that transition there is probably the most difficult thing to learn. But it's like anything else. It's like learning to walk. Once you learn how, it's easy. This kind of performance is made possible by the remarkable Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine, which puts out 21,000 pounds of thrust. The B model began flight tests in 1981. And while it may look similar to older Harriers, there are big differences, including the wing, several lift improvement devices, and totally updated avionics. Once underway, the Harrier is as quick as any other attack plane. Acceleration-wise, if you take a look at the airplane, you'll see that it's an uh, engine and wing and, and not much else. Acceleration, either from the deck or acceleration from the hover. 
is uh, unbeatable. There's nothing accelerates from the stop as quick as the AV8. It's just put the power up, your head goes back whether you like it or not. It's, it's going to go back. What makes the Harrier so important to the Marine Corps is its ability to remain close to the front lines. After all, close air support is what the mission is all about. First to fight, uh, always ready, first ones in, land the landing force. Well, that is true. That's what the Marine Corps is designed for, is to be ready to go any place at any time. Well, there's a, there can be a conflict going on, but there may not necessarily be a runway. I know the Russians can target every airport in Europe, but they can't target every thousand foot section of roads. And the Harrier can launch with full internal fuel of 7,500 pounds and nearly 10,000 pounds of external stores. While the vertical takeoff mode is certainly the most mind-boggling aspect of the Harrier performance, a more often used method of getting airborne is the short takeoff roll. The AV-8B can also be found at the Marine's second home, at sea, where, again, the short takeoff and landing mode is the preferred method of getting airborne. Marine Harriers have just completed a successful deployment to the Aleutian Islands, proving the AV-8B sea legs are in pretty good shape. But the undisputed leaders in putting Harriers out to sea are the British. It's called the Sea Harrier, a multi-role fighter and strike airplane. The British have moved away from the conventional format of landing and launching aircraft with steam catapults and arresting gear, and the Harrier at sea is proving to be quite successful. Vertical takeoff allows the Sea Harrier to react instantly to an enemy threat. There is no concern about things like wind over the deck. Rapid launches are possible using 50% of maximum payload. But like the Marines, the British also use the short takeoff, which allows for even higher payloads. In 15 seconds, you're airborne with full war load from a 500-foot flight deck. Not bad. These proven flight characteristics are enhanced by Britain's latest aviation development, ski jump. This allows slower takeoff speeds, easier handling, and payload can be doubled. Most often, vertical landing is used for recovery. Approach can be made from any direction, so the ship is free to move in any direction, a tactical advantage. The Sea Harrier is armed with a full range of weapons, including 30mm cannons and air-to-air -air missiles, like Sidewinder. It can also use the Sea Eagle standoff anti-ship missile, which is as dangerous as the often touted Exocet. Sea Harrier performance was tested in the 1982 Falkland conflict. In all, the British forces lost six Sea Harriers and four RAF Harriers. Argentine total losses stand at 100 aircraft. Although not all of those were due to the air-to-air -air action with Sea Harriers, the aircraft did prove their worth and will be a vital part of Britain's defense posture for many years to come. No doubt the same applies for the Marines and their AV-8Bs. 
Right now, budgetary constraints may limit the number of Harriers, but the mission is clear, and the pilots are more than happy with the Harrier's ability to accomplish the task. We're not the top dog in the Marine Corps. The Navy, the fighter pilots are the top dog, and the Air Force, the fighter pilots are the top dog. I'm a Marine uh, attack pilot. I'm a support asset for Marines on the ground, and uh, proud of it. In addition to the British and the Americans, the Spanish and the Indian navies have also ordered a Harrier. No doubt, this unique airplane will be around well into the next century. Now, since we've already touched on the subject of marine aviation, let's go into more detail on what it's like to fly for the Corps. Marine aviation has a proud history that goes back to the early 20s in Nicaragua. It is a unique organization that is designed to be part of a self-contained strike force. Together with ground forces, the Marines are tasked with going anywhere, at any time, and winning. In order to do that, Marine Air makes use of some of the most unique airplanes in the world. This is what it's like to fly for the Marines, starting with the F-4 Phantom. Light attack is provided by the A-4 Skyhawk. Marine Cherry Ground, this is Mike Zulu 2-0. One A-4 request taxi. Mike Zulu 2-0, Cherry Ground. Taxi to runway 5. Surface wind 0, 4, 0 degrees at 1-0. Altimeter 2, niner, niner, 8. Mike Zulu 2-0, roger. Marine Cherry Tower, this is Mike Zulu 2-0 for takeoff. Runway 5. Mike Zulu 2-0. Tower cleared for takeoff. And nothing compares to when the wheels break the ground and you know you're in the air. 
at that point. I've had the opportunity to go overseas, I've been to the Orient, I've been to the Lead and Hunt. Leads off left. Good hit, Slater. Target is personnel and automatic weapons. All weather attack is the responsibility of the A6 intruder. Days when you would fly from 6 in the morning to 10 at night in support of those young troopers out there. There's just no way you can describe it. Here or in writing, it's just a, just a feeling. And I just hope I can give a little bit of this feeling to the young cats coming through this corner. Target range, set your army. Roger, master arm coming on. The wave of the future in light attack is the impressive Harrier. Harrier is going to revolutionize tactics in regards to close air support. Uh, in addition, the Harrier also adds a whole new dimension to air-to-air -air combat, I think. And so do a lot of the other pilots. That there isn't an aircraft in the world that can stay on the tail of a Harrier if the pilot doesn't want him to. And the capability of the Harrier really turns me on. Its future employment is unlimited. Besides that, it's a hell of a lot of fun to fly. When you get an environment where you're bending the airplane around and you're, you're pitting yourself against somebody else, just kind of grow into that cockpit here. It's more of an extension of your arm than it is a machine that you're flying. You fly the airplane out the area. Once you get out there and you make a couple of turns, you're not flying the airplane. Your body is going through the air. Your body is moving around somebody else's body in space. And you don't, it's, I don't even think about the airplane is there anymore. It's more like it's me. I'm going around. I'm going upside down. I'm going right side up. I'm going up. I'm going down. I'm going to the left, I'm going to the right. It's me, not the airplane, that's going. Well, this airplane, it's got so much power that uh, there ain't no doubt about where you're going. It's going to feel like a rocket. It's going to like riding a rocket and you're taking up. All right, you're liking a flight of two aircraft to zero four. Everything from aerial refueling to cargo hauling is provided by the KC-130. Marine Cherry Ground, this is Marine 52187, C-130 to taxi. Marine Cherry Tower, this is Marine 52187 for takeoff. I really enjoy flying C-130s. I think if you're going to consider aviation, I'd give the transport community a great deal of thought. Flying for the Marines also means getting to know helicopter combat, as well as fixed wing. In one way, I think it was near 700 troops in one way. Uh, you know, you can picture the old biblical movies where you, know, where you have the cast of thousands, but it's just not done that way. You, know, you don't really have that many people troops, ground assault troops in, in one area. You 
Gary Copeland, sometimes known as the sports car of the helicopter community. Cobra, in my estimation, is probably the last aerial gun platform where the pilot gets eyeball to eyeball with his enemy. And I think that probably anybody that's uh, ever encountered the Cobra Spyfire will attest to its awesomeness. We uh, Huey drivers feel like we're doing a real service to the Marines on the ground. An uh, injured Marine can be transported to a field hospital quicker here than an automobile accident victim can be got to a hospital by mistake. to stay on station for up to five hours enables it to provide immediate close air support for the Marines on the ground. We're able to bridge the gap in time between initial contact and the arrival of jet air support. Throughout recent history, the Marines have proven their worth time and time again. One need only point to the Grenada operation to see how all the Marine air assets can be put to use. Now with the future in the hands of pilots flying planes like the F-A-18, Marine Air will enjoy an even more secure future. Marines pride themselves on being the first to fight. As always, they seem to have done an excellent job in preparing themselves to do just that. Now, let's head for the desert of Arizona. We wanted to do a story on A-10s. Well, there's no better place in Davis Mountain Air Force Base, home of A-10 pilot training. Watch this. The sun rises over the Arizona desert, shimmering above the A-10s of the 355th Tactical Fighter Training Wing. Most Air Force pilots who fly this airplane come here first, and there is no other plane like it. It was initially called the Thunderbolt II, in honor of another great Thunderbolt from Republic that was famous for the punishment it could dish out as well as take. But the A-10 was soon affectionately dubbed the Warthog. Not the prettiest airplane in the world, but certainly one of the best close air support aircraft ever built. This is Davis Monthan Air Force Base, an airfield steeped in the history of aviation. 
first dedicated in 1927 by Charles Lindbergh. The first military pilot to land here was Jimmy Doolittle. And today, the tradition continues. This is the center of the known world when it comes to A-10s. And to learn to fly it effectively, you start right here. What sort of things would uh, determine whether or not you landed? You said you'd look out and see if you're in a position to land. What would cause you not to land? Well, when I initially do the bull face and bring the power up there and uh, go around, I'm going to be in a leveling off kind of mode and I'm going to be getting a lot closer and a lot steeper. So I may be in a position where I have to push over to land. I wouldn't want to do that. Okay. But if I was far enough out on final that I could recapture the glide slope, then I would uh, go ahead and put it on the ground. Good. That's real Training an A-10 pilot takes hours and hours of instruction and a dedicated corps of instructor pilots. Men like Major Kevin Barley. Himself an A-10 pilot for six years with over 2,100 hours in the airplane. And that nose will have to drop to about 27, 28 degrees nose low before the wingtip is on the horizon, you know, 60 degrees of bank. Okay. There are over 120 hours of classroom instruction and lots of simulator time as well. In all, students will spend at least 10 hours in the confines of the sim. The only reason that there's a 355th tactical training wing is to train A-10 pilots. They leave here and go worldwide to the A-10 units across the world. We are here to train A-10 pilots. Any student will tell you an awful lot can be done to duplicate the experience of flying the airplane especially when an instructor pilot is watching your every move and helping program the situation from a nearby console. Tire Tucson approach, how do you read? Tucson approach, loud and clear, passing 3.5 or 7. Requesting vectors, PAR, full stop. Roger, copy that. Iron radar contact, turn right now. Heading of 120, this will be vectors for the PAR runway 30, Davis Moffin approach. Iron turn right now, heading of 303. Coming up from the to the glide path from below. As you can see, the electronics can make a night landing look about as close to the real thing as one can get. Three miles touchdown on glide path on course. The relationship between the instructor pilots and the students is a key element in the process. The Air Force already has lots of money invested in the prospective A-10 pilot, and every effort is made to see that he is successful. Lieutenant Jacques Pouchet will soon be posted to an operational squadron in England. The many hours spent with instructors like Major Barley have given him a good deal of confidence. Well, the hardest part is that the first time you're in the jet, you're by yourself. So there's nobody there to fall back on. You've got a lot of things that you've got to learn right off the bat because they can't fly you until you've learned all there is to know about the airplane, all the airplane systems, how it handles, how it flies, and that kind of thing. And then the first time, you're in there by yourself. And you just have to fall back on what you've learned in that first couple of weeks. We'll learn more about the training in a moment. But first, let's find out about the A-10. The story of the A-10 really began here in the skies over Vietnam. Aircraft like the F-4 Phantom did an admirable job, but it was not the best close air support airplane. It was never designed to be. Neither for that matter was the F-105 Thunder Chief. In fact, most of the airplanes used in Vietnam were not initially designed for that job. There were limitations in either loiter time, payload, speed over the target, or accuracy. The A-10 is the first airplane designed from the ground up for CAS. From the beginning, the A-10 was designed as a ground support airplane. It's not a perfect airplane, but it's real good at that job. So it, uh, as we were talking before, has a lot of weapons carrying capabilities, a lot of loiter capabilities, uh, very easy uh, to maintain. Uh, it can get in and get out of uh, small strips, a uh, lot of design characteristics. Uh, that are desirable for all airplanes came to the A-10, I think, largely because of the lessons learned in Vietnam. The Warthog was designed to cope with the problem quite well. Start with the twin TF-34 GE-100 engines. Each are mounted high on the fuselage to minimize the danger of foreign object ingestion. And their separation helps keep a hit on one engine from being a hit on both. 
Also, very little of the fuel is carried in the wings, so a hit will not cause a fire there. The flight controls are triple redundant, and there are two sets of primary hydraulic controls. All of the construction is rugged, built around triple spars, and the pilots sit in a so-called bathtub of armor that surrounds the cockpit. It can withstand a direct hit from a 37 millimeter shell. In short, the warthog can lose a tail, an engine, and two-thirds of a wing and still fly. The pilots who have to take it in close appreciate all the extras. All those things are nice, uh, but they are almost the last step defense. What you want to do is not be seen. And then if you're seen, uh, been, be unable to be hit. And then if you're hit, of course, the survivability features are what's going to help you bring it back. The key to the A-10's power projection is the 30mm 7-barrel Gatling-type GAU Avenger gun. There is nothing a tank fears more. No problem at all with the uh, gun doing a lot of damage to whatever it hits, um, including armor, and uh, very deadly, very lethal, very accurate. Now that we know all the background on this remarkable airplane, let's go flying and see it in action. The Warthog's students settle into the task of learning to turn an airplane into a weapon. For starters, that might involve getting enough fuel to reach the target. Learning to hit the tanker with the A-10 is a big part of the training. And there's more. Initially, uh, we'll go to some areas and practice air work, aerobatics, formation flying, um, simulated emergency patterns, instrument work. That's the first initial month, maybe, of the program. The object is to make flying the airplane second nature, because only then will a student learn to fight with it as well. And as you've heard, the instructor has to teach while flying in another airplane. You can tell a lot from the way the airplane is handling. Uh, you can tell a lot of even the student process, what his thought process is, while not even being in the same airplane. Soon comes the time to employ the airplane's most formidable weapon, the Avenger cannon is mounted right on the airplane's center line so that its recoil won't affect the flight attitude. It's quite a sight to see it in action. The gun can fire at a rate of either 2100 or 4200 rounds per minute. Each shell is the size of a small milk bottle and has a tremendous amount of kinetic energy. The warthog can literally tear a target to pieces. Jacques Boucher remembers the first time he pulled the trigger. You hear a lot how much it shakes a jet and you, the smoke blows by you and you get the smell of the gun gas. But the first time I fired it, I was concentrating so much on the target and hitting the target that I'd pulled off and was on downwind coming back for another pass when I really realized that that was the first time I fired the gun. Obviously, an enemy equipped with surface-to-air missiles or any other kind of weapon is going to try to put a stop to any attack. But the A-10 has engines which run at a reduced heat signature, and the location of the elevator helps to mask whatever heat source there is. Also, the A-10 is painted with a radar and heat dissipating finish, and those dull national markings are part of a low-vis package as well. It's all needed because it's dangerous down low. 
I think in a high threat environment, low altitude, lots of radios, lots of threats, uh, lots of uh, timely decisions to be made, no one in the airplane except you, uh, that's going to be as demanding a mission as you can get. Of course, the A-10 was not designed to fight other aircraft. At a top speed of only 450 knots, one might tend to worry about self-protection. But the A-10 can turn on a dime, which means any attacker could at some point come face to face with one of the most deadly cannons in the world. That's enough to make any wolf think twice about trying to pounce on this warthog. Most of the A-10 pilots that I know do not consider interceptors a threat in a high threat war. If we're ingressing low altitude, egressing low altitude, I don't think that many people expect a lot of losses to occur in the A-10 community because of interceptors. I think most of them occur because of ground fire, surface to air missiles. That'll be the real threat. Uh, if we're at a higher altitude ingressing and egressing, uh, then I think uh, we'll have more to worry about with the interceptors. But just to make sure, air-to-air -air training against dissimilar aircraft is part of the syllabus as well. from another mission. One of 37 training flights the student will take in order to leave Davis-Monthan with a chance to make it with a line squadron. With another mission in the bag, the Warthog will soon be cooling its gun along with the Arizona desert. But the next sunrise will bring new missions and new roles to perform. There are still horizons for the A-10. The airplane is already being used in the mission of forward air control. These airplanes will be known as OA-10s, and many National Guard units are now flying the airplane as well. The A-10 comes with a lot of things that are designed to help reduce losses. We're going to carry an ECM pod, uh, a, a jamming pod, to help jam their radars. The A-10 carries massive amounts of, of self-protection chaff to help break radar locks. It carries massive amounts of flares used to decoy those infrared missiles. Um, it can maneuver well. It flies very well at low altitude. It employs weapons that are standoff weapons, the gun and the maverick. You can employ those successfully, kill the target, and turn and never overfly the target. The future for the Warthog appears to be secure. In wartime, it can operate from lake beds, unimproved runways, and even highways. Recent additions of the Pave Penny laser pod, inertial navigation system, and the Maverick missile will keep it current into the next century. There is no question that the Thunderbolt II, or Warthog, if you will, is the tip of the spear that will help U.S. ground troops maintain the level of superiority they have enjoyed for years. And the 355th is the breeding ground of the fighter pilot who will accomplish that task. We asked the A-10 pilots if it was any difference between them and other Air Force fighter pilots. They said, no, not really, except perhaps Warthog pilots are better looking. Well, we'll give other pilots a chance to argue that in our next edition. Well, that's all for now. Hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next time on the Military Aircraft Video Report. So long, everybody.